This sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.christchurchsouthphilly.org. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. If you need a Bible, we want to make sure that everyone has a copy of God's Word in front of them today so you can shoot your hand up. And we'd love to be able to give you a copy of the Bible for you to use today and, and to take home with you if, uh, if that would be a blessing to you. As we're in Colossians chapter 3, we have two Sundays left in this series that we've been in, in this letter, and what a sweet time it has been as we've made our way through this epistle, which has repeatedly been making this one point to us again and again and again, that in all things, Christ is enough. Jesus is the supreme one, and he is the all-sufficient one, and so for everything, Christ is enough. We've been in the third chapter of Colossians for the past several weeks where we've been looking at how Christ is enough to shape our relationships as a church community. Today, as we come to the end of this chapter and dip into the first verse of chapter 4, we're going to see three particular categories of relationships and how Christ is enough to shape each one. And so I'm going to start reading this morning in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, which I already talked about last week, but it's really central to what we're going to read today as well. So let's turn our attention to God's Word, Colossians chapter 3 verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. God says to us through His servant Paul, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Let's bow our heads and have a time of prayer that God bless the reading and now the preaching of His Word. We prayed together as a congregation corporately. I want to encourage you to pray for yourself personally. Uh, bow your head and pray that God would speak to you through what you're about to hear. and faithfully in a way that is glorifying to God and helpful to you. God, we humble ourselves before you. We open our hearts to you. We pray you would come and through your inspired words, you would illuminate them to our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, would you meet us as we are today, but please do not leave us as we are. Would you shape us, mold us, guide us, and change us more into who you have created us to be in Christ for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray this because we need you. And so I pray that you would come and you would meet with us in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have you ever experienced something where it looked really good from a distance, 
But then when you get closer, not so much. Flying into Philadelphia and you see the sparkling waters of the Delaware River. It looks really good from a distance, but when you get closer, not so much. In college, when my wife saw me for the first time, she felt that God told her, that's the man you're going to marry. Fortunately for me, I was on the other side of the room when God told her that. Had she been closer, as godly as she is, I think she would have had a few more questions for the Lord about how someone as beautiful as her could end up with a schlump like me. Some things look better from a distance. They are not the same when you see them much closer. But in our passage, to, in our passage today, God is telling us that the exact opposite is supposed to be true for us as Christians. In this passage, Paul gives three categories of relationships. Marriage, parenting, and work. And what do each of those relationships have in common? Well, if you are married or parent or have a job, then the people in those spheres, your spouse, your family, your coworkers, those are the people that you spend the most time with. And so when we're told in verse 17 that whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, the best opportunity we have to live that out, the best opportunity we have to honor the name of Christ is with the people we spend the most time with. And so in our passage today, God is inviting us to find a sacred purpose in our everyday normal lives. In the ordinary grind of life, God's inviting us to see the tremendous opportunity we have to live out the greatest calling and purpose that we could ever have. We've been given the sacred purpose to honor Christ in how we relate with others, especially those that we spend the most time with. And so I'm going to tell this morning's sermon, the sacred in the ordinary. The sacred in the ordinary. And here's the big idea that I think God wants us to meditate on from this text. The big idea is that our desire should be to follow Christ so closely, the closer people get to us, the more they see Him. Our desire should be that, that we are following Christ so closely that the better people get to know us, the closer they get to us, the more time they spend with us, the more they see him. This is what it means to have a Christ-honoring life. And so let's look at what it means to honor Christ in our marriages, in our parenting, and at our jobs. And I recognize that in the first two points, marriage and parenting, not everyone here is married. Not everyone here has kids. But I just want to encourage you, if you find yourself uh, not in one of those seasons of life right now, to listen still carefully to what we're about to hear. Because our pop culture is constantly trying to define for you what marriage should look like, what parenting should look like. And so whether you're married or not, or whether you're parenting or not, oh, every movie and song and TV show is trying to indoctrinate you in things that are contrary to God's Word. And so if we are not actively understanding what God says about these things, we will by default be shaped by the world instead of controlled by His Word. And so I think even if you're not in one of those seasons right now, God's giving you an opportunity to learn what it means to be trained up in your mind in Christ. And also, if you're not in one of those seasons right now, as someone who's in both those seasons, we need your help. We need your help. Marriages need your help. Parents need your help. And so in order to see what God is calling us to and how you can support us in that, we want to go to God's Word. And then, you know, most people have a job, so that, that one at least will apply to all of us as we get to the end. So first, what it looks like to have Christ-honoring marriages. In verse 18, God says wives are to submit to their husbands. And then in verse 19, he says that husbands are to love their wives. I want to start by talking about the husband's role first. Because that word submission can often be misapplied, and it's crucial that it's understood within the context of a loving husband. The command here for husbands to love their wives might sound somewhat odd to our modern ears. Of course, a husband would love a wife. If you didn't love her, you never got married to her in the first place. But we need to understand, this actually was a very radical statement in the ancient world. This is not how ancient people thought about marriage. Commenting on this verse, theologian David Garland helps us understand when he says, most in the ancient world did not expect a marriage to be grounded in love. 
It was considered to be an accord, albeit an unequal one, between a man and a woman to produce legitimate heirs. And so marriage was not about love. It was about producing heirs, mainly male heirs who could carry on the family name. And so often in Roman culture, which is the culture in which Paul is writing this letter, a husband would have multiple wives because the more wives, the more chances you had to get a son. And so this call for husbands to love their wives is completely countercultural. Especially when we consider that this call for husbands to love their wives is described as something much more than just catching some feelings. Paul writes the same command to the church in Ephesus. He describes it in greater details. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The love that husbands are called to have for their wives is the love that Christ has for his church which means the husbands are called to a self-sacrificial and an initiatory love. Christ's love for us is self-sacrificial. He came and laid down his life for us. He valued us so much that he was willing to give his very self for our good. And he did this through his own initiative in conjunction with the Father. Christ did not wait for us to come and ask him to come and rescue us. Oh no, we are more than happy to live without Christ. He came, as Romans 5, 8 tells us, why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came on His own initiative. And so the love that's being called for here in husbands is the love of selflessness and the love of initiation towards their wives. Husbands are called to lay down their selfish desires and do what is best for their wives' good, and to show initiative to intentionally pursue their wives' good. Ephesians 5 makes this even more practical when Paul goes on to write, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. Part of how husbands are to love their wives selflessly and part of how husbands are to initiate is by washing their wives with the Word of God. In other words, the husband's call is to lovingly express selfless spiritual leadership in their homes. The husband's call is to lovingly express selfless spiritual leadership in their home. The husband should be the one who is saying, let's read this scripture together. Let's pray together. Let's study this word, this book together. Let, let's grow in this way and pursue the Lord together in this. And so as I read this, I'm reminded, as I often need to be, that I'm not to come into my home with an entitled attitude of how can I make things best for me. Nor am I to be passive and lazy but that my wife deserves my best efforts and most strategic thought and planning in how we can pursue the Lord together. She doesn't get the leftovers. She's supposed to get my first and my best. Husbands are called to love their wives like Christ has loved us with selflessness and initiation. That's how husbands honor Christ in their marriages. And within that context, wives then honor Christ as verse 18 says, by submitting to their husbands as is fitting in the Lord. In our sin-cursed world, that word submission has often been robbed of its beauty by being confused with the word subservience. Submission is not subservience. Subservience is about treating someone as less than and imposing your will upon them. And sadly, there has been a long history of some men using this scripture to wrongly coerce, intimidate, and impose their will on their wives. And I want to be clear, God's anger burns against that. Because that's the exact opposite of what we just saw that husbands are called to do. And because it's a completely wrong understanding of what this word submission means. Submission is not about subservience. It's not about just giving in. It's certainly not a term of weakness, and it's certainly not meant to denote any kind of inferiority. Because throughout the Gospels, Jesus talks about how He came in submission to the Father's will. 
Christ is certainly not a weak being who is made subservient. No, he is our great king. And so submission is not a lessening call, but it is a dignifying call. Because submission is about modeling Christ, who willingly chose to work with the Father to accomplish our salvation. Kathy Keller, the late Tim Keller's wife, has written helpfully about this when she says the, word, the verb submit, the Greek word hypotasso, does not convey some innate inferiority, but is used for a cooperative demeanor. See, this is what the word submission is. It is the willing choice to not pull against someone, but to lean into them and their leadership and to cooperate together to accomplish a sacred purpose. And we need to understand that all Christians are called to submit to one another regardless of gender. That's what 1 Corinthians 16, 16 said. That's what Ephesians 5, 21 says. That's what Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says. That's what 1 Peter 5, 5 says. Christians were to have an attitude of submission towards one another. We ought to, to be leaning into one another, to be having a cooperative demeanor with each other, to not working at cross purposes from one another. And so what we're seeing here is that what's commanded of all Christians in general, is being highlighted for wives specifically. So why, why, why is that? Well, I think to answer that question, we need to understand that all Christians are also called to love one another with self-sacrificial love. John 13, 34, Romans 13, 8, Galatians 5, 13, the whole book of 1 John. And so what's commanded of all Christians generally is also being highlighted for husbands Specifically, And so why are these calls to submission and self-sacrificial love that we are all to have as followers of Jesus, why is submission being highlighted for wives and self-sacrificial love being highlighted for husbands? We need to understand this is happening within the context of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve take the forbidden fruit and eat it, God places a curse on them. And this is what God says to Eve, speaking to about both Eve and Adam. He says to Eve, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. He says this about Adam, but he shall rule over you. That word rule means to dominate for your own purposes. And so this is the curse for the husband. We will struggle in our marriages to, to live for our own purposes, to seek to rule our marriages, to have things go our way. Some guys do this with force. Some guys do this with passivity, just emotionally withdrawing and not being present. But this is the core of the man's struggle in marriage. It is selfishness. And God says that wives will have desires that are contrary to, to their husbands, meaning they will want to pull away from them. And so wives specifically will struggle with the sin of not wanting to lean into their husbands, but instead to pull against their husbands and do their own things. And so with that context in view, we need to see what's happening here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. What we're seeing is the exact opposite of the sinful effects of the fall are being commanded. What we're seeing is that Christ is enough to reverse the curse of sin. In Christ, husbands who would otherwise struggle with selfishness can instead be marked by selflessness. We can instead be gentle instead of living in the curse of being domineering. And in Christ, wives can be marked by respect and leaning into their husband's leadership, not pulling away from them, not, not doing things contrary to them and, and, and being at cross purposes from them. Christ is enough to reverse the curse of sin and restore the joy and harmony of marriage. Because you know what happens when a husband is laying down his life for his wife? And you know what happens when a wife is leaning into the leadership of her husband? They're not pulling against one another, but are pushing towards each other. In other words, two are becoming one. There is joy and sweetness and beauty and harmony as God originally intended. Now, I think it's very easy in our marriages to be like, well, that sounds really nice. And I'm going to try to do that. But he or she 
is the problem in us living out this harmony of marriage. We need to remember that all this, again, is in the context of verse 17. Verse 17 says, and whatever, not your spouse does, whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, how we work these things out is not in accordance to our spouse. It's not based on them. How we embrace this calling for our lives is with a desire to honor Christ. And so even if our spouse is not displaying a God-honoring attitude, we are still called to do so. Because our motivation does not come from their treatment of us, but from our desire to please the Lord. Now obviously there are some, I think, qualifications around here for serious abuse. I think there are situations that can be dangerous. And so don't at all, for those types of situations, hear this, that you should stay in something that is not going to be safe for you. But generally speaking, when we're talking about marriages, there is conflict that will come up. And it's so easy in this conflict to think that the other person is the problem. But what this is telling us is that I'm not supposed to be worried about the other person. I'm not supposed to be worried about what they're bringing into the equation. As for me and my heart, I am here to serve the Lord. That's the attitude and mindset we should have, which should give us a robustness in our marriages. Because if we treat one another as we are being treated by them, well, we don't always treat each other that well, do we? But if the call is about honoring Christ, you know what that says? That says that I need to go back and I need to confess my sin and I need to ask for forgiveness and I need to humble myself and repent regardless of what my spouse is doing. And so guys, if you need to show more initiation in your, in your relationship, maybe this morning you're being called to be less lazy, less driven by self-interest, and instead intentional about pursuing your wife's spiritual growth. Ultimately, that's not about your wife. That's something you need to work out with the Lord. And wives, if you have a hard time leaning into your husband, that's not ultimately about your husband. Maybe you don't think he knows what he's doing. And the reality is he probably doesn't. But you aren't called to relate to him on the basis of him, but to honor Christ. You see, when we treat our spouses as they treat us, that's a cycle of conflict that we'll never get out of. What we need is to be rescued by divine grace to see that Christ is enough. And the closer we follow him, the closer we get to him, the more we see the beauty of who he is through his self-sacrificial initiatory love and through his willing submission to the Father's lead, the more we see the beauty of Christ, the closer that we follow Christ, the more we'll want to show Christ to one another. Our desire should be to follow Christ so closely that the closest people to us, our spouses, the closer they get to us, the more they see us. That's how we honor Christ in our marriages. Point number two, Paul moves on to say how we honor Christ in our parenting. In verse 20, God tells children there, speaks directly to them, children, obey your parents, which tells us two things. First, it says this, kids, I want your attention. Kids, this means that you matter to God. God is speaking directly to you from the Bible. See, he's addressing here. He's not saying here, children, he's not saying parents is how you should talk to your children. No, he speaks directly to children, which shows that Paul assumed that children were present in the church and were being addressed when this letter was being read. And so kids, I want you to know you are welcome here. You are exactly where God wants you to be. Jesus wants you here. Jesus wants to speak to you through his word. You matter to God. And you don't have to wait to get older to start participating in the joy of knowing the Lord. You can do that right now. God has purposes for you right now to live in the joy of honoring God. And you know how you do that? Well, verse 20 says, here's how you please the Lord. You please the Lord by obeying your parents. Now, I know that does not sound like a lot of fun. Here's something you have to remember, guys. Um, every parent also once had a parent. And so we know what it's like to be a kid. I know it's like to be a kid. And there were many things my parents told me to do that I didn't like to do. And there were many things that I wanted to do that they said I couldn't do. And I said, that's not fair. I'm sure I'm the only one who ever said that's not fair. Obedience is not always fun. 
Because I just want to ask you this question. How does it feel, and how does it usually just go in your life and in your day, when you disobey your parents? Like, when you disobey and get in trouble, how good does that feel? Think about some of your best memories as a family. They probably didn't come when you were disobeying your parents. They probably came when you were listening to them. And when you disobey and get away with it, when you don't even get in trouble because they don't know what you did, don't you still feel somewhat yucky inside? What you need to see in this verse, kids, is that God loves you, and so he wants what's best for you, and he knows that obeying your parents will actually lead to your most enjoyment in life. God's not trying to do something hard for you. He's inviting you to experience something better by calling you to listen to your parents. And also, notice what this verse says. Obeying your parents isn't actually just about them. Who gave you your mom and your dad? God did. And so when God says that you should obey your parents, what he's saying is that by obeying them, you are really obeying him because he's the one who gave them to you. And so when they don't let you do something you want to do, or they tell you to do something that you don't like to do, remember, God's the one who gave your parents to you. And so maybe it isn't fair. Maybe, don't tell them I said this, maybe your parents are wrong. Parents aren't perfect. We can, we can make wrong decisions sometimes. But your Heavenly Father is perfect. And you need to hear me on this. He can work through even your parents' imperfections to bring you good things. And so you're called to trust Him always by obeying them always. And parents, here's what we need to understand. That our, our kids have been called here to obey us in a because that pleases God. You know what that tells us? That tells us that our kids are not just our kids. Our kids are people who have been made in the image of God, who can actually live to please God. Our kids have a heavenly Father. And you know what that means? We will answer to God for how we parented our children. And what that should settle in upon our souls is that we have a responsibility before the Lord to carefully discharge the calling he's given us to parent the children he has entrusted to us. And if how our kids can please the Lord is by obeying us, you know what that means for us? That means we need to, with love and grace, bring authority to bear in our kids' lives and hold them accountable to obey us. Not by being harsh with them. Verse 21 makes that very clear when it says fathers are not to provoke their children by being harsh. Now he singles out fathers there, but we need to understand that both parents are to have authority in their kids' lives because verse 20 says children obey your parents, right? Speaking to both mom and dad. But fathers are singled out here uh, because we just probably naturally have a struggle more with being, uh, with being harsh. But the point is that we are all called, we, the point is that we are to call for our kids' obedience and to hold them accountable to obey. Not in a way that dominates them or domineers them, but in a way that reflects how God uses his authority in our lives. Like, our culture chokes on the word authority. We see it as a bad thing. And generally, that's because the reality is authority can get used in the world for all kinds of bad things. But just because the world has corrupted a word doesn't mean that authority itself is a bad thing. No, friends, authority is a beautiful thing. We are made by God to live under the authority of God. And that does not restrain us or restrict us, but God's authority leads us to thrive as he intends us to be, as people made in his image. And so in God, authority is a good thing. And therefore, parents, we are supposed to model the goodness of authority in our kids' lives. The primary place a child will come to understand the goodness and sweetness of God's authority is through how we express authority in their lives. And so we should be gentle, and we should be kind, and we should be consistent. If something is okay one day but not another, that's inconsistent, and that's going to provoke your child. If you never listen to what your child is thinking or feeling, if they're not allowed to interact and share their hearts, that will be provoking to them. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5 talks about how a wise person is able to draw out another's hearts. 
parents, we should be wise parents in being able to draw out our kids' hearts. By saying that we're to bring authority in their lives is not saying, I said it and that settles it. No, it's to say, as the Proverbs often says, son, give me your heart. Help me understand what's going on inside of you. Not so that you dictate what's going to happen, but so that I kind of lead you in the way it's best. Parents, we can't lead our kids anywhere if we don't know what's going on inside them. The best thing you can do as a parent is build a relationship with their, your kids where there's safety and security for them to disclose their hearts with you. We need to understand that as we seek to draw out our kids' hearts, as we seek to gently and carefully get to know them, we need to understand that, that we're not being faithful to parent them if we're not calling for their obedience. The air we breathe right now is let the children lead the way. Hands off parenting, where kids get to dictate everything. But what this passage is telling us is that permissive parenting is spiritual negligence. If your kids don't have to listen to you, if you find yourself constantly giving up or constantly getting in, if you have to bribe your kids to do anything that you tell them to do, who's obeying who at that moment? Who's really the authority? Parents, your, your kids won't learn to trust God by obeying you if you never actually hold them accountable to obey you. And so this is really what this is all about. This is not just about trying to control our kids. This is trying to connect their hearts to God. We can't make our children love the Lord. We can teach and model for them how loved they are by the Lord. And so we're meant to be an encouragement, not a discouragement. We're meant to be an encouragement by taking active steps of intentionality to set the table for God to work in our kids' lives. Listen, our, God can work in our kids either in spite of us or through us. I really hope it's through us and not just in spite of us. To start our summer, Angie had a great idea, uh, which I think she got from a podcast, but she had this great idea for me to take our kids out once a week where you just go through a book of the Bible with them. And this is kind of how our marriage works. Angie comes up with a great idea, and I do it and get all the credit. Uh, but she's the brains of the operation. Um, and so, so it's been really sweet. It's been a really sweet time. We take a little walk out to the coffee shop or the park, and I'm a big believer in change of uh, place leads to a change of perspective. And so we get out of the house. That's important for us. And we just take a walk together. And during that walk, I'll just ask them, hey, what have you been thinking about these days? Uh, what's something that's been making you sad? with something that's been making you happy, right? I'll ask them uh, how I can be praying for them. You know, get to hear their hearts through that. What's something that dad can be just praying for you to God about? I'll occasionally ask them, are there ways I could be a better dad to you? Just trying to model humility, and sometimes they actually have great thoughts for me. And then we read a passage of Scripture together and just talk about it. And I want to be clear, when this happens, it's not like the skies part and there's this, like, incredible moment of revelation, Right? It really, it's really simple. If you, if you got a picture into that, it's pretty simple, and it's pretty unimpressive, honestly. But man, I, I just want to be encouragement to my kids as they grow in their own relationship with God. And I'm not bringing that up as an example to say that you need to do what I'm doing. I'm sure there's many things that I could just learn from you. There's some fantastic parents in this church. Let's swap ideas together. But the point is that we should be intentional in how we're seeking to care for our kids. That should be what characterizes us because that's how Christ has treated us. He intentionally came and sought us out. And so as we look at how he has loved us, that should shape the kind of parent and parents that we are as we seek to intentionally model Christ to our kids. That's Christ-honoring parenting. Finally, Christ-honoring work. Christ-honoring work. In verses 22 through 25, we see this category of bond servants being addressed. In the ancient world, if someone went into debt, they could work themselves out of debt by putting themselves in what's called someone's bond. They, they would give their life for a certain amount of time to someone who would be their master. And so we need to understand that when Paul is talking to bond servants here, maybe your translation of the Bible even says slaves, uh, this is not at all like the chattel slavery of our country's dark chapter of history. Let's be really clear on that. We need to be really clear that Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, expressly forbids stealing of a person and selling them with a punishment of death. As the people are like, oh, you know, we're using the Bible to justify slavery, weren't reading the Bible. 
Because if they were, they should have been quaking in their boots because God was saying he was going to kill them for what they were doing to people made in his image. And so this is not at all talking about addressing our, what happened in our dark chapter of history, something entirely different. It's really people, again, who, are, who have, have bills in their life. And so in order to pay their bills, they have to work for someone else. It's very similar to our understanding of having a job today. And so what this is saying to us is that if you work for someone and you have a boss, you are to listen to them. And not just listen to them because like, you'll get ahead. Not just listen to them as a people pleaser because it's easier to go along. No, why? This directs us to God. We are to work for our bosses because ultimately we recognize we are working for the Lord. We, we, we work, it says, in the fear of the Lord. Verse 22. That's fear not of being scared, but fear as in reverence. It's like we want to honor God. And how we honor God, verse 23 tells us, is by working heartily. We do our best. We work as hard as we possibly can. There was a guy in my former church who kept getting fired from jobs because he was always talking about Jesus instead of actually doing his work. And so I just had to sit him down one time and I said, Brother, I'm so grateful and inspired by your zeal for Christ. But I just want to let you know, no one is taking seriously what you have to say because you are not taking your work very seriously. And so your life is contradicting the message you're trying to give with your lips. What this passage is telling us is that as we work hard, that can be a way to gain respect, and that respect can often be a platform from which we can share about Christ and people who actually want to listen to what we have to say. And so let's just be clear. There should be no one who should outwork a Christian. There should be no one who should outwork a Christian because we're not just working for a paycheck. We're not just working for the next accolade. We're not working to win awards or get recognition. No, we are working for God. So whether people are seeing what we're doing or not seeing what we're doing, we're going to do the best we can with all that God's given us in his time, ability, and resources, we're going to do the best we possibly can because the God who sees all things is seeing us in those moments and our jobs are about honoring him. I think Dr. King captured what this verse is saying so well when he famously wrote this. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Friends, this is how we honor God. This is how we honor God. Whether we are making the most money in our work or the least money, it's not about the money. It's about honoring Him. And so you need to understand, friends, your job has tremendous purpose. Your job has tremendous purpose purpose. Here's how you shake off the Mondays tomorrow. You wake up and say, today I'm in the service of the King and I'm going to work as worship unto Him. And if you have employees, if you are a boss, if you have leadership and authority in people's lives, verse 1 of chapter 4 addresses you as well. It tells you to be just and to be fair. To not use the people under you but to treat them well. You might have authority over them, but you are to remember there is one who has authority over you. And so as you consider how Christ rules you with kindness and love and fairness and justice, you are to reflect Him to others. Your goal as a leader in your office or job or company or whatever, your goal is not just to get people to do what you want, or even just to get them to do what your company needs, ultimately your goal is to represent God's authority and how you use your authority. Our desire should be that we're following Christ so closely that the closer people get to us, the more they see Him. And so as we come to a close, the question I think we should be asking ourselves is this. How is God calling me today to grow in honoring Him? How has God called me today to grow in honoring Him? I'm sure we can all answer that question because no one is getting a straight A in any of these verses. And so here's what we need to understand as we consider that question. As we become aware of the areas where we need to grow, and I'm very aware 
of areas that I need to grow. What God is doing for us is giving an opportunity to us to experience more of him. All these roles are in reference to Jesus. And so what that is telling us is that how we grow is not through us trying harder to be better people. No, how we grow is by looking to Christ more and more in dependency on Him. Being aware of where we need to grow is an invitation from God to experience more of Christ's great love for us. And it is His great love for us and meditating upon it and saturating ourselves in it and being filled with the Spirit so that our hearts might overflow with the fullness of God. It is Christ's great love for us that produces growth in us. See, friends, the good news of Jesus is that in all our failures, all our weaknesses, all our sins, all the areas that we can at times be so acutely aware that we need to grow in all of those things, Christ is enough. Christ is enough. And so Christ church, let's look to Jesus. And as we do, let's pursue growing and honoring Him, especially to the people who are closest to us. Because the more we see His beauty, our desire should be to follow Christ so closely that the closer people get to us, the more they see Him coming from us. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer.